These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. The Assyrian Empire is on the march, and has risen slowly over the past 30 years since Ashurdan took the throne and ended the century-long Dark Age that had blighted the region. The video game Civilization is not, in general, a good model for human history, but in this one case, our current king, Adad Nirari, does look like he's slowly, sort of turn by turn, marching out of his starting area to establish control over the land and resources around him. He's slowly building, or often rebuilding, his temples and walls and granaries and barracks. He's battling the barbarians who wander the map, crushing their camps. And he's finding workers to bring back to improve his lands and grow his population. Of course, he's not finding them in random huts. He's burning and pillaging their towns and force marching them back to the Assyrian heartland. He even shows the almost sociopathic disregard for human life that most video game players exhibit, slaughtering all who inconvenience him for sometimes the smallest of material gains. But Adad Nirari isn't only bringing all this wealth and conquest in for the benefit of the capital. As we're going to see going forward, he and the other Assyrian kings share an ideology of benefiting Asher through their actions. Now this means benefiting the god through increasing his glory and his offerings, but Asher is also the realm as a whole, all the Assyrian people who notionally serve the patron god. In a very real sense, for the Assyrians, every war is a holy war, in a way that we really haven't seen previously from polytheist cultures. But what this also means is that there exists a degree of ideological equality among all the districts of Assyria. Not all the people of Assyria, just all the districts, which are sort of like their states or their provinces among the greater nation. You see, Asher will always be the religious center and the only place where the god directly resides. And as the political capital moves in later generations, it's going to continue to have a degree of prominence in practice. But in theory, all the people of Asher contribute to the god. All the people worship the god and all the people are blessed by the god in equal measure. What this means is, in this case, is that Adad Nirari, when he's listing his accomplishments, mentions that he built palaces in each district of the land, and in each land he undertook to foster more agriculture and increase the number of plows. Now, what sort of policy this corresponds to exactly is unclear. Did he increase the number of state-run farms? Is this connected to the increased population from the Sabu, which is the class of deportees? Or did he simply demand more in tax for the state granaries? He likely did build more granaries, and between the administrative centers and the collection points, he's doing his part to build a proper empire out of his various ragtag assortment of conquests. In his annals, the construction of these district centers gets less attention than the fact that he hunted a bunch of animals. 360 lions, 240 bulls, and 6 elephants. But of course, from our perspective, this unglamorous district infrastructure is the backbone of an empire. The things which allow coordination and distribution throughout its borders. He didn't build these things with empire in mind, though. As I was saying, the god Asher is unlike other polytheist gods at this point. He is the patron god of both city and nation, and he has become something of a universal deity, expressly competing with the Babylonian patron god Marduk for power and influence. However, Asher literally can't move, since he is the god of the small rock mountain at the heart of the city of Asher. Therefore, since every city can't have their own Asher, like they have with their own version of the other gods, they must all, in a centralized fashion, equally give tribute to the great god in his one single city. 
This religious motivation is what ends up holding the empire together. It isn't necessarily that all the newly conquered peoples immediately fall to their knees in awe of the divine patron, though certainly over time many groups do come to peacefully add Asher to their worship, and through that they adopt Assyrian identity. Rather, the nature of the god demands a level of uniformity across the empire's many districts, as well as a degree of institutional regularity, causing the construction of these administrative and distribution centers in each district. For the people on the ground, knowing that their taxes were going to the god and not to the king, and that their taxes were basically the same as everyone else, and having a nearby magistrate to watch over the proceedings carefully, all three of these things are assurances that you often couldn't get in their former kingdoms or in other empires. And when times were good, this sort of order, this sort of regularity, and to a degree this sort of equality, serves as the carrot to prevent rebellion, with the stick, of course, being the terror of the Assyrian military. Now, revolt still happened, but because of Assyrian administration and theology, it may have happened less than might otherwise have been the case. And we see succession rebellions happening less often, as one king dies and another king takes over. Under the earlier Babylonian and Akkadian and Hittite empires, we saw towns try to break away at the start of pretty much every new, new king since most ancient treaties and loyalty oaths were sworn to the king and needed to be renewed each succession. But Assyrian oaths were sworn at least in part to the god Asher, who didn't change even if his earthly representative changed. Of these administrative centers which adad Nirari constructed, we hear most about the town of Apku, halfway between the northern mountains and the Assyrian heartland, which had once been a major Assyrian town, but then had been abandoned in the Dark Age, and was now reconstructed in splendid fashion by the king to firmly mark the king's control over that northern area, confident that there were no longer any threats to that part of the heartland, or at least wanting to convey that he was confident enough to build a giant palace and sure that no one was going to burn it down. And so, with the core secured and the south quieted, and the northern mountains humbled and the eastern mountains kind of irrelevant for the moment, the only direction of expansion is west, towards the Kabar Triangle. And it occurs to me that I haven't really explained the Kabar region. The Euphrates in southern Mesopotamia goes basically north-south, but once you get further north, it splits off from the Tigris and heads westward into modern-day Syria. Now, once it gets into modern-day Syria, there's a tributary in eastern Syria, which is itself fed by a wide delta of rivers. The main tributary is the Kabar River, and the entire region is called the Kabar Delta, or nowadays the Kabar Triangle. This is the most fertile region between Mesopotamia and the Levant. I mean, between southern Mesopotamia and the Levant. In a sense, it's still technically Mesopotamia, though whether we count it as that, or if we count it as upper Mesopotamia, or as something separate, really changes from person to person, depending on the area of interest and time period that you're looking at. None of that matters. What matters is that it lacks natural defenses, and therefore it's threatened on basically every side. It's also a fairly rich area and has been the heartland of some significant kingdoms, and it was here probably that the late Bronze Age Mitanni were headquartered. This is the Hanigalbat, if you recall from the Mitanni period. Now, Adad Nirari wants this region. He wants it because he lusts after conquest for the sake of conquest, and that's just how it kind of is. But he also wants it because it is excellent agricultural land, which can feed his growing empire. Perhaps of equal importance, he wants it because of the Phoenicians. You see, 
This is right about the time that the Phoenicians are starting to become trade powerhouses. And though we have no direct records of Levantine trade with Assyria at this time, it seems quite likely that at least some was occurring. However, with the Kabr Triangle under Aramean control, the route from the two rivers to the sea was under constant threat by wild bandits and Aramean governments, and the two were not always very different from each other. Both had an interest in pillage for its own sake, and the Arameans had a potential strategic reason to prevent trade from flowing into the growing Assyrian Empire. The king's forays into the Kabr region begin with Katmuhu. You may remember that his father, Ashurdan, had attacked the Katmuhu lands, then flayed the king and displayed the skin on the city walls. At the time, Ashurdan had not incorporated the city into the empire, just left it as a vassal. But something occurred in adad Nirari's early years to convince him to incorporate that kingdom more fully into a proper Assyrian district. It could have been a rebellion, though we don't hear about one. It could have just been a fully political or diplomatic annexation, changing the king to a governor and the vassal state to a district. This would have had implications both ceremony and economically, at this early phase, we can't really say exactly what all those implications might have been. And so, in 901, Adad Nirari sets out to what was known at the, as, at the time as the land of Hanningalbat, which the former heartland of the Mitanni Empire. There are, of course, no Mitanni there anymore, but instead a group called the Tamanu, led by a fellow named Nur Adad. Now, we don't know a whole lot about these Tamanu. They appear in history here, and then they'll be gone by the time Adad Nirari is done with them. But they appear to have built a pretty substantial power base in the Kabr region, and it's the main enemy to clear in order to lay claim to the entire region. This first campaign seems decently civilized. Both sides know that the other is coming. They both draw up their armies and fight a field battle outside the town of Pausa. And then the darndest thing happens. The Assyrians lose the battle outside of Pausa. Now here's what the annals tell us. It says, we drew up in battle formation at the city of Pausa, at the foot of Mount Kashi'i'ari. We fought with one another. I brought about his defeat from the city of Pausa to the city of Nasipinu and destroyed his numerous chariots. And then he goes into the next year. See, Adad Nirari claims victory, because Assyrian annals nearly always claim victory. And yet, from other annals and other sources, we know that the Assyrians do, in fact, lose battles and even entire wars in places that are either unrecorded or sometimes recorded as victories in the Assyrian accounts. This is a genre that gets called conquest literature, and it's essentially just boosterism, Orwellian doublespeak. Sometimes we have no real details about an event aside from a brief description in these annals, and so at a certain level we sometimes have to just trust the Assyrians that they conquered something, even though we know they're not always trustworthy. But if we peer just a tiny bit beyond the triumphalism common to these texts, we can frequently look at what they omit, or at what occurs in subsequent years, to often get a good sense of what is actually going on here. So in this campaign, we hear that there was a battle involving the towns of Pausa and Nasapinu. However, we don't hear about plunder. We don't hear about mass destruction. We don't hear about slaves. We don't hear about installing any local rulers in any of the towns. We don't hear of anyone offering submission to Assyria. We don't hear about atrocities. We don't see any lists of what the army carried away in triumph. All we hear about here is that fighting occurred and chariots were destroyed. This right here is a red flag in the annals that no actual victory was achieved.
More than just the absence of usual victory signifiers or careful reading of those victories that are claimed, assuming that it's the best that Adad Nurari can boast of, we can also often look at other texts, or in this case even just other years in the same text, to see that the city of Nasapinu remains unbowed. As the army returns to Asher following what we could most charitably call an indecisive engagement, but at least they, you know, destroyed some enemy chariots, they make plans to march out again, and in the following year again assault the town of Nasapinu, and again without result. Adad Nirari's claim of victory here is that he turned the countryside red with the blood of his warriors, likely meaning that he won the engagement outside the walls and was able to put the town to siege, but was unable to breach the town's defenses. Instead, his army spent much of the year pillaging local towns, which he seems to have entered with little fighting and taken all the barley and straw for miles before finally disengaging and returning home. Now, returning home empty-handed is kind of a bad look, but the king has already proven himself decently well in previous years. Those were the campaign's last episode, and coming home this time with a bunch of free grain would likely have pleased at least some in the city. So he returns again the next year to try again, and this time he moves away from Nuradad's fortress town of Nasipanu, instead of attacking another Tamanu settlement of Huzurina, near where the first battle took place at the foot of Mount Kashiari. This time, the Assyrians finally have some success. They breach the walls of Huzurina, and they occupy the palaces of the town, and it seems a Tamanu leader named Mamli had ruled over this area. We don't get a sense of whether he's a governor of Nur Adad or a ally of Nur Adad or just a unrelated leader that also happens to be of the Tamanu people. Whoever he was, this king spends a f the, this king gets defeated, and our king Adad Nirari spends a few months enjoying the palaces of the land and securing them to his rule. Meanwhile, the town of Bit Adini, down on the Euphrates, so it's sort of where the Kabarb meets the Euphrates, they've heard of the Assyrian victory. And even though Bit Adini is not in the direct path of conquest at the moment, they decide to send a gift to Adad Nirari while he's in the neighborhood. In this case, he receives a pair of monkeys, which is exactly the sort of gift I wish that someone would send me. I like monkeys. Monkeys aside, the army returned home for the year and set out again in the next campaign season, this time under provocation. While the army had been home, a Tamanu war leader named Mukuru had decided, apparently in violation of some truce, to take advantage of the Assyrian absence. He either already held or captured the town of Gadara, which Adad Nirari notes had once been a fortress town and administrative center under Tiglath Pileser some 200 years ago, but which had been lost to Aramean assault since then. This town was apparently a massive fortress, but the combination of revanchous desire and fury at Mukuru for attacking while under truce kept Adad Nirari from quitting. He claims to have, in this siege, invented the tactic of counter-fortification, wherein a ring of forts is constructed around the city to maintain the siege for an extended period and keep the besieging forces secure. Against Adad Nirari's forts were high walls and a deep moat around the whole town but with a mighty push, the Assyrian army was able to breach the defenses and, quote, with force and violence, end quote, bring down the city. Adad Nirari personally entered the palace following the sack to inspect the former lord's wealth, chariots, horses, and family, all of which were bound up and brought back to Asher in order to demonstrate the strength of the great god in triumphing over foreign lands and demonstrating his conquest of the Kabar region generally. And the next year we see that he has 
generally speaking, convinced a fair amount of Hanigalbat to bend knee, since instead of going to war next year, he just marches with his army from place to place in the Kabar Triangle and just demands tribute everywhere he goes. This sort of thing is part victory parade and part a strengthening of his authority. He can sort of remind everyone who has already submitted of why they gave in. As well, everyone who maybe hasn't fully submitted yet can be encouraged to bend a little bit further, you know. And seeing all the neighbors acknowledge Assyrian supremacy is likely to have an effect of, on formerly untouched neighbors as well, who might hop on the tribute bandwagon while it's rolling through, before it turns into a chariot rolling over you instead. In the next year, which is probably about 895 or so, Adad Nirari is finally in position to get revenge on Nur Adad for the terrible shame of having defeated the Assyrian army in battle. He marches to what appears as the final great campaign of the Tamanu War, with rage filling his strong weapons. Fortunately, most of the Tamanu lands have either been defeated or submitted in the three previous years, and Nur Adad can now be securely surrounded at what appears to be the capital of Nasapanu. In the intervening years, Nur Adad has not stood idle, knowing that a showdown was definitely coming. He dug through bedrock to construct a moat around the city, but Adad Nirari constructs seven mighty, mighty redoubts to encircle the city, then has his men on constant patrol around the edge of the wall. Either his men on the wall or the men patrolling were apparently constantly screaming. Though whether this is psychological warfare of, hey, let's scream constantly just to mess with their heads, or if the enemy is just in absolute terror the whole time, is unclear. But I mean, the whole screaming all the time thing, it sounds miserable for everyone involved. I don't want to listen to it, and I don't want to be the one screaming constantly. But the Assyrians don't care. They've trapped the area around the city so that passers-by or potential reinforcements and supplies would be caught before having a chance to either escape or enter the city. And Nur Adad was able to turn the mighty fortress into a sealed tomb for the Tamanu. Now, it seems the Assyrians never did manage to actually breach the city. Rather, it seems that the city was starved out, something they could afford to do now because the Assyrians are now on basically friendly territory, with everyone around them on their side and able to keep them supplied and free from external attack. When the starving populace finally relents and throws open the gates, we don't hear about a generalized slaughter. Significant plundering of the royal treasury is recorded, including a golden tent so heavy and large that the Assyrians were unable to weigh it, and a great deal of oxen and beer were captured for a later set of elaborate offerings to the god Asher. That's burgers and booze. The people themselves were apparently integrated rather peacefully into the Assyrian territorial system. Lands of the palace and captive soldiers were given to native Assyrians, and everyone was basically told to, you know, <clears throat> get along with each other. Everyone, that is, except, of course, for Nur Adad and his main core of surviving soldiers, of course. These were bound and led on parade through Asher and Nineveh, and possibly through some other cities as well. At which point, Adad Nirari appears to have realized that he still had time in the year for fighting. And so in the same year, having just won his giant war, he's like, hey, I got time, let's go, let's do this. He goes to the northern mountains and he captures two more cities and their surrounding regions in a pair of bloody but quick battles. These were not made districts, but tributaries, and following the initial plundering, a set of tribute payments was arranged from each to the king. The Tamanu War, which had taken between six and eight years, 
was finally over. But Dan DiRori seems at least somewhat satisfied at the moment, or at least he sees the need to start consolidating his new holdings. However, late in the following year, on the edges of the Empire, the city of Kumu comes under attack from a group called the Habhu, so he needs to march out and deal with that, which he accomplishes with fire and returns home with plunder. However, only a few months after he returns home, the Habhu attack again. So this time when he returns, he conquers, burns, ravages, and destroys the major cities of the Habhu, and that quiets them down a bit. Kumu, by the way, is not just some place that got attacked. It was one of the sources of horses for the growing empire. And we will be seeing more and more of the importance of certain horse breeds, not only for chariots, but also for the nascent cavalry divisions, which are starting to be formed in the Assyrian army. Stepping away from the annals for a minute, though, it's important to realize that Adad Nirari and the kings before and after him are not merely bringing plunder into the nation. Already at this early juncture, he's bringing people into the nation as well. Slaves, of course. Slaves by the hundreds, if not by the thousands, are flooding the markets in the city of Asher. This is changing the demographic makeup less than you might imagine, though. Slave men very rarely seem to father children. They usually live and die in bondage without family in the vast majority of cases. Their miserable lives cut short through labor and hard conditions and no opportunities permitted for, shall we say, affecting the genetic stock of the land. Slave women are more variable in their treatment. Many of these do end up pregnant in circumstances that appear to run the full range all the way from, of course, violent assault of serving or craft women, all the way to quasi-wives or even full wives, taking the domestic and emotional roles, occasionally, of marital partners. The children from these typically took the status of the father. This is actually a really important holdover from the old Babylonian law, and one of the sort of foundational keystones of the slavery system ever since Hammurabi's great innovations and forms. But slave breed, because of this, slave breeding is much less of a focus of the slave industry in this era, since the newly captured slaves were pretty much always much cheaper than trying to breed a new generation of slaves. Our sources are extremely limited. We can sort of pick out that the most brutal and the most caring of situations were both considered exceptional. But the median slave girl was almost certainly far more property than a lover. Manumission for slaves was not impossible, but it was rare, especially for the foreign sorts of slaves that we're mostly focused on here. I mean, debt slavery was also a thing, but indebted Assyrians often got slotted in different sorts of roles that made purchasing their freedom rather more likely. Like I said, slavery was a thing affecting the population, but slaves were a minority of the people being brought into the empire and disproportionately unlikely to have children. Far more important were the Sabu and their expansion land, and, and the lands that are being expanded into the empire. I've previously shown in the show that mass deportation has been happening for a very, very long time. We saw it when we looked a bit forward in history with Israel, but even in the late and middle Bronze Ages, empires were already practicing mass deportation where whole communities would be taken from their land and resettled in vacant lands in the center of the empire. The exact status of these people is not something that we have a concept for in the modern world. Indeed, the entire economic basis for deportation is something that really doesn't exist anymore. The ancient world was so sparsely populated that there was nearly always more arable land than there were people to work that land, at least 
I say the ancient world, I mean ancient Mesopotamia in specific. I don't know about the whole world. But the whole world doesn't matter. This is a serious show. Yes. Because while the best lands were definitely taken, but there were always, it seems, more marginal areas that could be profitable, that could feed a family if there was someone to work them. And often, there were even more lands being created through constant irrigation projects in good times. Now these, these Sabu, they're an awkward people to speak about just from the standpoint of language. They're not from the point of view of the empire deportees. In fact, they're usually importees, taken from places either recently conquered or sometimes not even fully conquered, just raided, then brought further into the heartland. They're not migrants, since that often implies like a voluntary nature to the movement, of which in this case there was certainly not any voluntary component here. Yet neither are they slaves. That much is exceedingly clear. The migratory marches of the Assyrians are not death marches, as is clear from both Assyrian and non-Assyrian depictions alike. The Assyrians were, of course, no strangers to brutality, yet we hear from both propaganda and bureaucratic records that the death rates on these marches were kept to the minimum that could be managed for a giant population that had usually just undergone all manner of famine and war, and partly because of that, carts were frequently arranged to carry the young and the elderly and the sick. And where the propaganda during the war, which initiated the deportation, would have been all blood and violence, kill them all, destroy everything, the depictions of the march itself are fairly neutral. It's just a thing people had to do. And the promised destinations, they're not the barren sort of lands that we Americans dumped the defeated natives on, but decent and sometimes actually superior agricultural lands to the places that the people left. And one quick thing, I've been bringing, talking about the Sabu over on TikTok, which always a mistake, nothing good happens on TikTok it seems, but a number of people really, really want to analogize the Assyrian importation of foreign workers with the American immigration situation. And this is quite wrong for two main reasons. The first, of course, is that the American empire, let's say, is not forcing people to enter into America. Indeed, quite the opposite, the American government is at least notionally opposed to these people entering in. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into modern political debates, but it's definitely the fact that these people are not being given an official status. Uh, they're, not, they're not being forced here at gunpoint they're being discouraged in to at least some degree. The other major difference is that is the economic difference. Assyria is bringing people in because it needs laborers because it's largely empty. In a way that America and most modern economies really aren't. A person who comes in to a modern economy has to fit himself in, has to find work. Uh, they're not being given government lands, let's say, to build, to make farms. Very early on in American history, there were periods of time when people could just go out to the West and they'd be given a certain acreage of land to work. That's not happening anymore just because they're not handing out parcels of land anymore. These guys are getting free real estate. I mean, they don't want that real estate. They wanted the real estate they had, but they can't have the real estate they had anymore. But they're not being, like, chained up and sent to the mines. That's the important thing here for understanding the Sabu. 
once they arrive in their new lands, back in ancient history again, they would be met by cartloads of goods in most cases. They'd receive tools, seeds, both of those seem to have been pretty universal, sometimes also clothing and livestock. Assyrian trainers were provided by the state in some periods to live in these Sabu communities and teach them how to do agriculture in their new land. Now, the people already knew how to do agriculture, but they'd be taught the peculiarities of the local climate and any new plants that they'd be working with, things like that. It's assumed, though it's nowhere stated, that these trainers were also aids to the Sabu in integrating with the wider Assyrian population, learning the language and the procedures for taxation and justice and worship and whatever else might be required. And, of course, you know, just generally helping them out. Not for their own sake, it's so that they can be economically valuable, but it's a good thing to be economically valuable. Now, it's widely taught in biblical studies that the Assyrian and Babylonian deportations were different in character because the Assyrian deportation would scatter a people across the empire, while the Babylonian deportation would bring specialists to the cities. While this is the evidence we have from the tales of the Bible, this doesn't seem to have been true generally. Typically, the intellectual classes of a conquered region, as well as specialized laborers, would have been brought to the capital city to pursue their trades, even among the Assyrians. Indeed, great care seems to have gone into finding the best niche for the people being deported. It is, in a way, rather like the human resources departments of large organizations nowadays. I mean, experiencing the HR department may sometimes feel like you're being ground down and exploited by someone who sees you as a resource. But when you talk to most actual HR workers, they typically see their job as keeping the employees happy within the framework allowed to them. Similarly, the Sabu were resources for the state, and they were more valuable when cared for, the way a cart would receive maintenance. The Sabu typically got resettled with their families, often including extended families, and typically what was asked of them is that they make a life for themselves in order that they might be taxed, not that they serve brutally as slaves. It seems that in some cases, the defeated kingdom it had actually had higher tax rates previously than even the Assyrian tax rates, making even that a step up as well. The thing about the Sabu, though, is that they weren't Assyrians. They didn't come in, in many cases, with Assyrian language and Assyrian customs. They were treated as second class, below full citizens. However, what I think is most remarkable about them is how quickly most Sabu communities vanish as distinct groups in the records. And I think, I think this isn't just an accident of historical records. We see biblically that the people of Judah considered the deported northern tribes to have simply vanished within remarkably few generations. The Sabu assimilated into Assyria to a remarkable degree, and at the same time, Assyria, for all its reputation for ferocity, was quite happy in many cases to bring these people in. Anyway, anyway, we're going to see a lot more about the Sabu going forward. The other demographic shift is all these new people who are being conquered. Not everyone conquered gets moved, and with the Tamanu War, it seems that most of the conquered people were neither moved nor slaughtered, but remained where they were, only to have the government above them get shifted. The people who lived here would have been a mix of people, Luwians, Hurrians, especially Arameans, and a variety of others with fairly little ethnic strife between them that we can see. The wars of the era are mostly for communities, bandits, and warlords to steal more plunder and land, not for heady ideological reasons, 
which seems to have crowded out the more petty identitarian wars that our more peaceful age has a bumper crop of. But these people, too, were brought into the empire on fairly even terms, kept in their families, and while some would need to learn Akkadian as an interface with the government, many communities also kept some of their distinctiveness even while assimilating into Assyrian life. And so, the Assyrian Empire, even as early as Adad-Nirari and his father Ashurdan, is already becoming a multi-ethnic, multilingual community, and very importantly, the Aramaic language is already entering into the empire, destined to ultimately become the primary language of the entire Near East until about the time of Jesus Christ. These Aramaic language speakers, they're coming in through the same routes that we've discussed. Some of them are being conquered, and then now they're just a part of the empire. Some of them are being brought in as Sabu, and so now they are speaking Aramaic within the heartland of Assyria. It's not probably noticed right now, how quite how many Aramaic speakers are being brought in and of course the language of the the official language of the government is going to stay uh, the Assyrian version of Akkadian for pretty much the whole time but this transition into Aramaic this is happening right here at the beginning with Adad Nirari as a direct consequence of the policies of empire. Now there is of course far more to be said about all of this, but that's where we're going to leave it for today. So join us next time as the Babylonians strike back, right around the same time that the Assyrians decide to pause and really take stock of whether or not they're actually interested in this whole empire thing. Spoiler, they're going to decide that they really are interested in the whole empire thing. Thank you for listening.